And welcome back to another episode of the Brett Snodgrass Podcast. I am Brett Snodgrass, and we have a great show for you guys today. Before we get into our guest for today's show, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, the Brett Snodgrass YouTube channel, and subscribe, leave a comment. I love responding to comments. That's like what I do all day, and that's what I do for fun. So make sure you do that. Also, subscribe to our audio channel wherever you listen to this podcast at on the audio version only. So with that, I got Jonathan Farber on today's podcast episode. What's going on, Jonathan? You know, just uh, enjoying summer, man. Back in Long Island, all things good. And uh, like we were talking about a little bit before hitting record, just a little bit of a reflective time, man, but but no complaints, man. Everyone seems to be doing well and getting ready to kind of bounce back from COVID. And uh, I'm definitely one of those people, man, kind of just enjoying things. Sounds good. Well, I am uh, really excited to have you on today's podcast episode. And if you guys haven't heard of Jonathan Farber, he is the man. Number one, he's 27 years old. I like to call anybody in their 20s Young Bucks. So I'm going to call you Mr. <laughs> young Buck, Jonathan, today. So 27 years old, uh, side hustle real estate investor, able to achieve financial freedom at 27 years old. He left his corporate enterprise technology sales job to focus on entrepreneurship in the real estate space. He grew up in New York, but now he splits his time wherever. Actually, he is a, a nomad or a vagabonder, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, he's been everywhere uh, over the last year or so, but he likes to spend time in North Carolina, Florida, and Long Island. He's also an avid golfer. So check him out. He played golf in college, and he still plays today. Uh, he has a podcast called Millennial Millionaires Through Real Estate. It's one of the fastest-growing real estate shows that helps young entrepreneurs uh, achieve financial freedom. So with that, Jonathan, uh, thanks again, man, for being on the show. It is a pleasure. I know I was on your podcast a while back, and it's good to see you here. And uh, one of the things I really want to focus on today is millennials. And I know that your show really focuses on that. And what is a millennial? I had actually looked that up. I'm like, what, what is a millennial? And it's actually the ages between 25 and 40. So I missed the millennial generation by one year. I'm 41. And, uh, so that, that stinks. I wish I was a millennial. I think I'm a gen X guy, but, um, mm -hmm. But millennials, all, a lot of times, they get a bad reputation. Maybe they they're self they say that they're self entitled, lazy. I I don't know. You know, they they grew up in in this this era where you know they had things maybe given to them. But you like to really focus on millennials, and I want you to flip the script. Maybe because I don't think they have a bad reputation. Maybe that's just what people think in their minds. So so let's talk about millennials. Number one, like you you teach millennials and you really focus on that. So talk about this millennial generation, number one, and what's your take on it? Well, one, I am a millennial, so it's a little easier for me to talk to an audience that I feel like I can relate to. If I was talking to people that were in their 50s and 60s, I don't know how much I'd be able to actually give them advice based on experience. But I, I also like to think about it from the sense of they can maybe catch some of their, or I, I was the same way, but catch some of the bad learnings or habits or teachings before they get too far down the path. And then it gets much harder, I find, to kind of unstick or unravel once you have kids and a lot of bad debt and family and all these commitments that you feel like would be impossible to walk away from. So I, I definitely like that audience, one, because I am one, but also because I find that there's a chance that maybe they could start building something before they get too far down the, the path, can't learn, can't teach an, an old dog new tricks type thing. And I feel like, you know, if you catch someone maybe 22, 24, 26, whatever, that they can still make changes that will impact their trajectory. That, you know, like my whole thing is like, um, there's, a, there's a multifamily investor I like, you know, and he posts a lot about this mantra, like, which if you watch, if you've seen the matrix, like, did you take the red or the blue pill? And, you know, like, I think most people, and I think we talked about this when you were on, on um, my show, Brett, was people just kind of, I find sleepwalk or they kind of just go through this preset dogma of you're supposed to go to school, you're supposed to get a job, you're supposed to put money in retirement accounts, you're supposed to take your two or three weeks vacation a year. And then from there, it's just kind of, you know, retire and hopefully you have some time left at the end. So I feel like at, it, for, for this like age, there's a way that you can kind of catch people and maybe they can start to course correct or at least try to get a little bit more of kind of the question in their minds of what makes me happy? What do I like doing? Actually do something called lifestyle design, which I didn't come up with, but I love Tim Ferriss. And, you know, four hour work week was one of the most impactful books on my life. But 
really just ask that question. What do I want to do every day? What type of lifestyle do I want to live? And, you know, I feel like it's just easier to do at that age. Um, you know, and, and I, I don't have all the answers by any means as, as just being 27, still learning all the time, but I feel like I've gotten better at asking that question and, you know, people like yourself and other mentors, um, have kind of helped me ask that question just on a regular basis and then just kind of not go through the motions, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Do you think it's easier um, for millennials to really take in the information that we teach, right? I mean, we talk about purpose, real estate investing was a little bit different, entrepreneurship's a little bit different. I mean, when I was in school, uh, yeah, I mean, the get a job thing, go to a good college and work 40 hours a week for the rest of your life and get the pension or whatever, that was really, really ingrained. Do you think it's you know, in your age, is it more open? I mean, are people like, I don't, I don't want that. Like, is it just more, uh, people accept it a little bit more or is it still like, Hey, this is the thing you need, you need to do. Um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's still part of the like infrastructure. Um, I think actually COVID has done something to change a lot of that because I think now a lot of people that feel they're forced to go back to a job, um, are experiencing that for the first time that they've been home, they've been working on their own schedule, and now they are being kind of like disrupted again to be back in an office and realizing like, I don't like that. I, I don't like having someone pull my time or not have time freedom. So um, I, I don't know. I think, yeah, with like all the like side gig generation and side hustle generation, I think, yes, it is a little bit more like possible. And I think as more people kind of get down the path of, you know, any of the like newer entrepreneurial strategies that are kind of plug and play, if it's like drop shipping or wholesaling or um, flipping stuff, like you don't need to be tied to an office and in person um, like you would maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And I think that just appeals to a lot of people. So I think it's a combination of both. It kind of just got me thinking, I just reread um, The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. And, you know, just talking about the concept of like, you know, the past generations were more from like uh, labor or for trading time for money, but there's a lot more information workers now that you can kind of work from the computer and design a system or, you know, hire people to outsource different parts of the business. So I think it's a combination of it's become more possible. And then as it's become more possible, more people are talking about it, teaching about it. And I feel like people have probably always wanted to do it, but now I don't think it's as hard you don't have to i think like reinvent anything there's i think a lot more plug and play strategies and you know like you know brett i think you talk to anyone about real estate um everyone wants to get involved with it but i think now you know at least with the circles or people that i talk to there's a lot more strategies that i think are being kind of um openly discussed where people can get in stuff like house hacking or buying second homes or maybe doing something with Airbnb or, you know, learning the process of flipping or wholesaling. I think the information is a lot more accessible. Um, that's also, I think, a big part of it where, you know, like some people just don't like to read. Their mind doesn't process information with reading. Well, now YouTube has everything. You don't need to go to college. You have, you have YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's probably a combination of the wants always been there. I think the information is a little more accessible. And then I think now like bringing it really micro, like with COVID, people just don't want to be back in an office. You know, yeah. like they got a taste of time freedom and now it's become a little bit more of like a possibility. So I think it's a, you know, combination of factors, but um, just the thing on millennials, you know, like people at all age are lazy, you know, just the 80, 20, the 80, 20, maybe the 80, 20 are the ones that actually do it. So like when people say millennials are lazy, everyone's lazy, you know, Gen Xers lazy. are lazy, baby boomers are lazy. <laughs> millennials are maybe just as lazy, maybe lazier, but you know, it's just, I, I, I almost look at it like, well then maybe if you're not lazy, it'll be that much easier for you. So yeah. I never really harp on like, who's lazy, who's not lazy. Yeah. I'm like, you know, uh, me and you, or me, you know, I, we can push ourselves to do stuff. And hopefully everyone else gets lazier because yeah. then it'll be easier for us, you know, they just kind of keep pushing. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's like millennials laziness kind of lumped into one answer. No, I love it. Thank you so much for, for shedding light on that. And in this economy, in this culture, I think uh, just being a freelancer, entrepreneur is is just so much available, 
right? I was just thinking about that the other day is like, if you're sitting home, it used to be like in my age, like if you couldn't get a job, you, you couldn't do anything. Like you just have to sit home. If I was in my twenties, oh man, I can't get a job. Nobody's going to hire me and all this. But now there's so much opportunity that you could, right? Be an Uber driver. You could go to Instacart and get someone's groceries for him, right? DoorDash. There's all these different things that you can do at freelance. And I just think, um, and it's going to keep growing and growing. And, uh, the entrepreneurship is, is just growing. I think it's the millennial generation too. They're creating all these amazing things, right? It's like all these apps that are so cool, these sharing apps. And I just think it's awesome. So I want to hear about your story though, Jonathan. So like you're 27 years old, right? And you had real estate investing, you got into that, you left the corporate enterprise technology sales jobs and to become an entrepreneur. And, and now you're living this life that's amazing, fascinating, that you're traveling mm. around kind of a nomad. I, I don't know, you know, traveling in the country of the United States, you're thinking about going abroad. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but just tell us about your story, man. Like how did you get to a point where you able, were you able to leave your job at 27? Okay, so for me, it started at 22. Um, a friend recommended I check out Bigger Pockets. For those who don't know, it's I think about it kind of like Facebook for real estate. It's community. There's education. Um, you know, just like a great platform. Honestly, if people are wondering how to start, I would say delete Facebook from your phone and Instagram from your phone, and just use that as social media along with LinkedIn, and you'll just have a better habit. But it's just a great place to meet people, network, get information in your brain, learn about the lingo. Um, so for me though, that was how I started. I just became obsessed because I was kind of a go-getter out of college. I didn't really, I wasn't growing up. I had like a life change where it was like a light bulb. And then I was like, I need to just stop being such a knucklehead and kind of turn things around. So um, I wasn't exactly sure the direction, but for me, it just meant sales at a technology company. But very early on, even though I was successful in that, um, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. And another great quote from, you know, four hour work week, if you don't admire the people that are 20 years ahead of you, it's time to pause and probably make a trajectory change. And I didn't really admire any of the people that were 20 years ahead of me. They were kind of miserable. So even though they're making a lot of money, it was the definition of golden handcuffs. So um, kind of got obsessed with bigger pockets, started reading about it, learning about it, talking to people, you know, no one in my family had done anything with real estate. They thought I was crazy for a long time. Still probably think I'm fairly crazy. But um, anyway, um, I just, in my head, I, I learned about the term house hacking and that strategy made sense to me. I moved from New York to North Carolina where real estate was much more affordable. And then from there um, was able to just actually dig into trying to buy something. So I just started learning, going to real estate meetups, and then kind of getting into the house hacking mode of I'm going to buy something and rent out the other rooms to people that I work with and then live for free, you know, because I thought about it of I don't need to replace I don't need to replace my W2 income, I just need to replace my living expenses to be financially free. So that first step for me was how much do I spend every month? Big part of that was on housing, car was paid off. But um, housing was a big part of it. So if I could knock that off, then add some income streams, I was like, I'm not that far off. So for me, the goal was always to be financially free by 30. So um, yeah, what that meant for me, like tactically, I just started looking at tons of places, you know, and I, I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't, but I did something that I recommend everyone that's listening to this do, or just anyone that's like got the bug and doesn't feel like they came from these natural real estate connections. I reached out to the first over hundred guests of bigger pockets virtual coffee. Hey, I'm sorry. I know this is annoying, but can I just get 15 minutes on your calendar? I heard your episode. You talked about this. It really resonated with me. I just wanted to learn from people that were doing because I didn't have any mentors. So, you know, talking to a lot of them, they were like, you know, giving me kind of the base of here's what you look for. Here's what you might need to worry about, you know, do this, that. And um, then at the same time, reading books. And then I just started going on showings to see as many houses as I could. And I mean, super long story short on that, you know, found a property that, that worked. It was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, it was a three bedroom, bought it, rented out the two rooms, the people I worked with that sat next to me in my cube at, at that corporate job and made money to live every month. And that was the first taste of, wow, this is pretty powerful. And, um, you know, this isn't even considering anything like, you know, depreciation or tax write-offs or just kind of then potential cash flow. It was just the concept of living for free. That's what first hit me. Um, proceeded to do three of those, the last one being a four unit in Raleigh using something called an FHA loan, where by living in it, you can put down as little as three and a half percent, which is the only way you can buy a four unit for less than 20% down. 
So um, that kind of would have been maybe what I would have done a little earlier at the beginning, but I didn't have the money and I didn't know. But anyway, um, so I did that three times. The third one was a four unit. And um, that was really how I got my start. But like during that time, if you could you know, imagine, I was saving money because I didn't have a housing expense. I was making more money in my W2 job. So that combination enabled me to have more cash and then buy more stuff. Um, you know, everyone's read rich dad, poor dad, you know, I wanted to buy more assets that would produce cash flow. So I was, you know, I live pretty frugally. I do love golf. It's, it's something I will always maintain. Um, but you know, I was like, that's my only big expense. I don't care about clothing. I don't care about food. You know, like I just want golf and real estate and then, you know, like friends and whatever. And, um, then super long story short, I moved back to New York to like progress in my corporate job. Um, and then I was doing that really hustling, kind of put real estate on the side for a little while, but I was like hating it. I hated New York. I hated the grind of the city. I was eating out with people, uh, every night and it was just, I hated it. It was just not the lifestyle I wanted. And I felt like I was kind of just like faking my life and faking these kind of, I felt like an actor. Cause I was like, mm. I have to act like I like all these people. I don't, I don't dislike <laughs> them, but they're not, I don't like them. Right. You know, this is just like fake and it yeah. didn't seem genuine. I didn't feel like I was living kind of what I wanted. So I made the decision that I was going to just leave New York and uh, spend some time in the Midwest or the Carolinas um, and just wait to get potentially fired from my job. You know, if they found out <laughs> that I left the area and um, then COVID hit, which, you know, I, I hate to say this because it affected so many people negatively, but it turned out to be in that case, sort of like a little bit of a miracle because location didn't matter. Mm. So when that happened, you know, I was like, this is my chance to progress, you know, my five-year goals, maybe into my one-year goals during COVID, not being in an office. So uh, I moved to the Midwest Louisville, Indy, uh, nice. Ohio for about three months. And at that point I was just looking for multifamily. I had a lot of cash saved up. And then I did cash out refis on my, my four places at that point. And, uh, I was ready to rock. I didn't end up getting any multifamily property there, but I did meet partners who then I started doing wholesaling with. And, uh, that then indirectly led me down a path of meeting someone that kind of taught me about short-term rentals. And then that became kind of my, like all in focus for the next six months where um, that really progressed the timeline on some things using a strategy, um, buying properties with a second home loan, 10% down. So I bought a couple of those. And then really at that point, I, I added three properties like that in the Carolinas. Um, and I was just thinking I'm staying in this job until I can use up all my residential debt. Uh, and then after that, I'm basically just going to kind of the same thing, wait to get fired, you know, like just I'm working on this. I could maintain my, my status in the company. No one noticed, you know, like my advice to people, if they're in a corporate job is do not quit, just use the job and don't let anyone notice you're not doing anything, but just get better with your time so that you can then do real estate on the side, use the job to get the loans you need. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, if you want to walk away, you can walk away. Yeah. So that was pretty much it. So added those, those, um, properties that were done with Airbnb and, uh, those are stood up one in Asheville, one in, or two in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and then one in Raleigh that we just converted to an Airbnb. And between all those, that got me to a number of about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a month, you know, in cash flow. That um, I did not need to be at that job anymore, and I couldn't get any more residential debt. So um, that's when we parted ways. It was literally the same week that I closed on the last one in Asheville, and um, that was it. And then, you know, now it's a different game of just trying to figure out, you know, what to do with my time, and you know, what businesses or what just what I want to do, but very high level. That's kind of yeah. like, uh, everything. Yeah. And then this past year where things kind of a little more gas on the fire. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love your story. Number one, uh, because it's not super sexy. It's not like you came in, you quit your job at 24 years old and you went all in on a hundred unit apartment complex. Like some guys come on the show might talk about, but I love the simplicity of your story. Um, the strategy and, and I think that really resonates with people because I know if I'm listening to a guy and he's talking all these huge things, then, then I don't really resonate because I, I'm more of a simple guy. And number one, you talked about house hacking, which I know you talk about in your podcast a lot. That's how you started. So for 40 years, I believe 
believe from 21 to around 25 years old, you house hacked, which guys, if you don't know what that is, check it out. It's all over bigger pockets. Like Jonathan talked about, it's basically buying a house and, uh, and renting out the other rooms or buying a duplex and renting out the other side or four unit and renting out the other units. Um, it's basically having other renters pay for your house. So you basically are live for free and possibly even make money on it. And I always start there. So a lot of people don't understand that, um, well, how do I get into real estate? How do I start making some money? And and I say, hey, look, at what, what are you already doing? What do you already own? And can you make any money on what you already have, what you already own? Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's so many different things out there right now that you can uh, that you can make money at right uh, let's say you can rent out your car um, you could possibly do that there's websites uh, I just had a camper well there's uh, websites that you can rent out your camper I have a boat too and you can rent out your boat you can rent out your house maybe you have an in-laws quarters that you can rent out so there's so many different things that you can that you can do to make money so start with with wherever you're at and uh, and I think this really resonates with people about house hacking and uh, Jonathan did you like keep the other units, like that first three bedroom, did you keep it and then just built up to another four unit, but you kept that one and rented it out as well? Yeah. Um, and actually, Brett, I'd love to get your opinion on this too. You know, like that in in talking to a lot of those people on bigger pockets, you know, early on, you know, a very common thing that they would say is, you know, I'd ask the question, what would you do when you were 22? You know, me being 22, or what would you do differently? And a lot of them said, I would just have never sold. So, you know, like for me, that was burned in my head. I don't know if it's, you know, good or bad at this point. Um, that's, that's what I would love to hear from you. But like, for me, I just, I couldn't think of enough good reasons to sell if I was able to do cash out refinances. Um, you know, cause I thought in my head, like, well, you know, I could sell it for a profit, but I'll, I don't have a license. So I'd have to pay broker fees and then I'd have to pay taxes. And I, I just didn't see a scenario where for me that was going to end up netting more than doing either a cash out refinance or a home equity line of credit or a home equity loan. And, and for those that don't know, that just means, you know, you go to a bank and you tap into some of the equity that um, maybe you've paid into or maybe you force some appreciation or equity by the value going up just naturally or you putting work into the property and making it go up. So I don't know, for me, I just I just kept them. I, I refinanced them. Uh, one I've refinanced twice and I just, you know, rented them. And now one of them we converted to a, a furnished rental and, you know, it's, it's done well in that sense. But um, yeah, so I haven't, I haven't, I only sold one that um, I had with a, a partner that we had a little bit of kind of like just a, like I'd say a gentle kind of change of, you know, partnership feel and uh we sold but other than that I, i've kept them but um yeah. Brad, if i could ask back to you i'm curious do you do you see any you know what, what reason you know would you think is good reason to sell a property yeah. instead of doing that yeah uh, that's a great question i mean everybody has their own opinion on that i mean obviously i've sold a lot of properties so i mean <laughs> that's what I, that's what i do i've bought and sold properties that's how we built up our business and uh but i've also kept some and i've seller financed some and but um uh, you know, the thing I always come back to when someone comes to me is I always, especially if you're just getting started, like you talk about your W-2 job, I think it's really important to have some sort of an active income. And if you don't have an active income, I think it's really hard to scale a uh, a rental business, right? A buy and hold business. I think it's just, it's just hard to scale if you don't have an active income because it's very slow. It's very... Um, you know, methodical, the banks might not, you know, look at you very well if you don't have an active income. So you had an active income with your W-2 job, which like that's what you said, right? That really helps you get the loans, things like that. So let's say now you've quit your job and now you have some rentals and you can show some income. But, but for me, like my job and my active income is my wholesaling business. And uh, that really helps fuel the passive income side. So the passive income is the wealth, right? It is the wealth. It is the tax breaks, the depreciation. It is all of that. But I think it's just hard to scale that if you don't have some sort of active income. It doesn't have to be flipping. It could be, I don't know, a good job or uh, or content, right? I don't know, you know, but mm -hmm. I think some sort of active income I think is important. Would you say? Yeah, or? yeah absolutely. I, I think, you know, that that's a good distinction there that it's not just um, like one size fits all. If you have a property, hold it, you know, like there's ways that you have either active or passive income and, you know, like rentals or Airbnbs could be passive, but then you have an active way to make money, which would be 
flipping or wholesaling, you know? And I think it just depends. Like right now, look at the market. It's like, it, it's crazy hot. I mean, you read on social media, everybody, they say, oh, if you can't make money in this real estate market, you're, you suck, right? <laughs> um, and it is. So right now, I don't know. I think you could probably get the best price right now for a house than you have in, in years. But you could probably also get the best refinance. You could as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you have to make that that distinction. Um, but uh, I don't know, you know, who, who no one has a crystal ball. But I do think that, um, that, you know, if you sold a house at a high price right now and you had that money and, you know, you invested a little bit here and there and waited a couple years, I do think you could buy that same house that you just sold for a lot less money. Mm. I don't know. So, and you could sure. have the same house and maybe you could buy two houses. True. So, yeah, spot on. Something. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Definitely. So, anyway, so again, thanks for sharing that. Very, very tactical. I also loved what you said about really getting on Bigger Pockets and you reached out to the hundred people that were on the Bigger Pockets podcast, I believe, and really just wanted to pick their brain and sit down for virtual coffee, whatever it was. But uh, you really immersed yourself. I think that's really, really important. I just got back from Guatemala on a missions trip and I don't really know Spanish very well. So I asked mm. uh, one of the uh, the Guatemalans over there, I said, hey, how, what's the best way to learn Spanish? Should I take a course? And he said, you just need to immerse yourself and live somewhere. Like that's the best way, right? Just immerse yourself in it. And I think that's what you did with real estate. And I'm sure you probably talk about that a lot, but what was that like, right? Just was it too much information? You didn't really know what to do. Shiny object syndrome. Sometimes people say, oh, I, you can learn too much. And then you just get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. What's your take on really just immersing yourself in that? I think it's um, better than doing nothing. It can be overwhelming at times. But, um, you know, like a good rule of thumb that, that I like to think about or live my life by is to really try to model people that I admire or look up to, you know, like one of my first mentors, actually not real estate related, but just probably one of the most successful people I know in business. He, you know, told me not to, to be very careful taking advice from people that I wouldn't trade places with, or I don't admire in that field. And it actually made me realize that everything we do is typically the opposite of that. If we're working in a corporate job and we're talking about buying real estate, we're listening to people that probably had one bad experience. If we talk to someone that, that works in that job or, you know, why would we take advice from them about real estate? They are in the job that we don't like. They're in a position that we don't like. So for me, it was just, and I didn't, again, come from anyone that knew real estate in my family. So if it was all about just leveling up that circle. I feel like that is such an important thing. I mean, so many places talk about it. You know, you're the average of the five people and just leveling up your temperature and just, you know, like, the easiest way to get better at something is changing your environment. So for me, I just knew I needed to level up that group of people and I needed real estate friends. So for me, that was then a matter of, okay, how am I going to meet these real estate friends who aren't going to be the ones that are telling me about the one time they, you know, had a toilet and a tenant was being a problem and all this, you know, like the, the typical stuff you hear, but you never hear a real real estate investor complain about that stuff. And that's what I found from bigger pockets. And then, you know, what I typically tell people is because you know, you, you probably get this question a lot. And now after doing the podcast and, you know, YouTube and Facebook group, I get the question a lot too, of where do I get started or what should I do? Um, and the thing that I, and, and what, what I realized was a lot of times when I would be on those bigger pockets calls, people would ask me, what are your goals? And I realized there's a big problem with that because I wasn't educated enough to create goals. Mm -hmm. So I would throw out a goal that was either probably misinformed or it was just setting the bar too low. So for most people, I would say, you know, learn about the different strategies. So for me, that was learning about wholesaling, multifamily, flipping, Airbnb, uh, Airbnb arbitrage rather, and just kind of figuring out which appeals to me and which do I think I could be good at. And then from there, trying to find mentors within that space. And we could talk about that, like how I think anyone could find a mentor for free without you know, paying a very high ticket. I mean, paying is totally fine, but I think there are ways you can kind of get around it. But for me, then it was a matter of getting a base level education to figure out which path or topic was interesting to me and then pursue the people down that path that I knew were really good at doing it and start vetting them to see if I could be friends with them, help them with stuff, then be my mentor and kind of just learn the ropes that way. But yes, it definitely was 
daunting and a little overwhelming, but at the time I really needed that because I didn't have anyone telling me anything about real estate. The only people that were telling me about real estate were telling me negative things. Mm. And, uh, that I just knew was never going to be, you know, yeah. a possibility. Yeah. So you talk about the people that you admire and I love that. I think you learned it from Tim Ferriss about look at the people 20 years ahead of you. So if you're in the corporate job, you're looking at these older executive people probably and looking at their life and and thinking, I don't know if I want that life. Right. And that's a good question to ask. Uh, and I would highly recommend all of our audience to do that. Like whatever you're doing, look at the people in your career 20 years ahead of you and see, uh, would, do you want that life? So Jonathan, when you started really thinking about that and who you admired, what were, who were some people that kind of came to your mind or what, what were some qualities that came to your mind? Well, I'll actually go one step back and, and like, I think, you know, and you, you were the same way on, on your podcast, uh, Brett, I, I just want to be as tactical as possible. So there was an exercise I did that like changed my entire life. Um, if you just type into YouTube, Frank Kern, perfect day, this helped me out so much. I mean, you could read the books, but you know, some people are visual and this was the first time I'd ever heard it laid out this way of, you know, we all have goals. Every book will tell you to set life goals, yearly goals, quarterly goals, which is amazing. And I think that keeps you chasing. And as Gary Keller would say, it keeps you appropriate in the moment of what should I be doing right now? But that Frank Kern exercise, a friend sent me probably three years ago. And what it talked about was just thinking about what is your perfect average every day and, and go through it in detail. So if you watch that exercise, you know, like you'll see it, but questions like, where do I want to wake up? What are my first thoughts of the day going to be? Who do I wake up next to? What do I eat? What type of work do I do? You know, what do I, who do I hang out with during my meals? What do we talk about? What do I do for fun? What do I do for exercise? You know, and just plan out what a perfect day would be. And for me with that, I, I could just kind of go through it quickly. And then I tried to back into it was, I just wanted to wake up in a warm place every day. I wanted to be with a significant other that I loved and I don't, you know, kids, I'm not exactly sure if I've had kids yet, but anyway, like then I wanted to have a great morning with this person. I like to start my mornings kind of quiet and slow and not super reactive. Um, maybe walk or read a book or go get coffee or just kind of like start to think about the day. And then, you know, he talks about in that one, because a lot of people hear that question. They're like, I would just play golf every day mm -hmm. or I'd go to the beach every day. And he's like, you won't be fulfilled. He's like, I did that and you're going to be miserable mm -hmm. and you're just going to wonder what's my purpose here. So, you know, he's like, you need to do some fulfilling work. It's just a matter of figuring out what is the fulfilling work you like to do. And, you know, like that is still, still something that I'm figuring out. But my answer in that was I wanted to be creating content. I wanted to be doing deals where I felt like I had an impact either for the people on my team or my investors. Um, I wanted to be mentoring or helping people that were dying to learn more about real estate and were hungry and were showing up. Um, and I wanted to be done with my day every day by two, three o'clock and then go play golf mm -hmm. and play golf with friends that I enjoyed hanging out with that were talking about their deals or their family or fun stuff, not talking about the news, not talking about crap that they can't control, you know, and then again, winding it down with a meal with either family or friends at my house or whatever. So basically what that helped me do is realize, okay, I don't even need a ton of money. Like my original goal was I wanted to be a gajillionaire, but then I'm like, why, you know, like let's create a plan for that. And I realized for me, like I could achieve that exact day for less than eight or nine thousand dollars a month i mean uh yeah a month comfortably so um then then for me i was thinking okay what are the paths to do that and for me in a shorter period of time it was people that were doing wholesaling airbnb um affiliate marketing creating content and those were all things that i felt like i could be fairly good at and then within those i started just looking at the best people in the space and then for me i've i've just always been a believer of if your time is worth anything, you know, to try to find the best people to show you the ropes and try to compress your timeline. I think we could all figure everything out on our own if it took two years, but if we had a coach or a mentor or a mastermind, it might take four months, you know, mm -hmm. so what's your time worth? So for me, you know, when we got into Airbnb, I hired two coaches. When we got into wholesaling, hired a coach, content creation, bought two courses, you know, and just try to figure out what are the best practices to kind of get that off the ground. So, and, and I'll also say within that, um, I would say half have been good and half have not been so great. You know, like what I also like about it is once you get around some of the people that you, 
you know, think have everything perfect, then you can learn, are they really a good person? Do they really have family figured out? Mm -hmm. um, are they happy? And, or are they just faking it and making more money off their core sales than the actual business they run? You know, and sometimes that's demoralizing, but then again, it's, you won't know until you try. So for me, I've had some coaches that it was great and some not so much, but the, you just need one. Yeah. And, you know, for each thing that I've tried to do, I feel like I've had one that was good enough that could help me now live that perfect day. I mean, like, again, my life isn't perfect. And, you know, we talked about this on our show a little bit, Brett, of just like purpose and now figuring out what you do every day. There's other sets of challenges that come with life. I'd least like to be able to make those choices myself instead of someone else. But, you know, like for me now, my typical day is I wake up, I work in the mornings, either creating content. I like, I'm, you know, not everything there, but now I go play golf in the afternoons and, mm -hmm. you know, like it's a cool feeling to kind of just have something that you set out and then you do. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, I'm at right now, but I think anyone can do that. And, and I guess, sorry, I just, this is a little bit more of a rant on this, but like for finding a mentor, I know this is one that a lot of people get tripped up on and, and I could send it to you, Brad, it could actually be something, you know, maybe decent for the show notes, but originally like the best example I could think about was Joe Fairless was the person I wanted to be my multifamily mentor. He's written a great book. He's put out a lot of content, you know, in the space of multifamily, he is one of the top people. Um, and I was like, how do I get around this guy? He charges 50,000 for coaching, which I didn't necessarily feel like I wanted to spend at the time, you know, <laughs> not a lot of money. Like, having a ton of money. It's a lot of money. So I was like, what are the things I could do to bring this guy value? So I came up with a, I, I filmed a video on myself, introducing myself. And I came up with a 15 point, um, I guess deck of here are the things from, different categories of your business that I think I can help you with. Some of it's content creation. Some of it's down to walking properties for you or cutting grass or following you around with a camera, literally whatever. These are the 15 things I think I could do to bring you value. Um, and you know what? He responded the next day and he wouldn't have charged me the 50,000 because he just wanted to bring people like that into his world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone has the same problems. Um, for most people, it's finding deals, creating content, social media, um, administrative tasks, scheduling things. These are all annoying things for people. Mm -hmm. And if you can just get around the people that you admire in those spaces, after you've done a little bit of like life searching, you can get around them and see if they're legit or not, if you don't want to pay or just pay and paying is fine too, because you know what? Uh, everything is a price. It's either time or energy or money. And you know, you'll, you'll get out of it what you get out of it. Yeah. Sorry. Super long rant. No, I love I just, it. Yeah. I love it. I, I, I super believe in coaches and mentors as well. Uh, I do get asked that question a lot, but it's funny because I'm entering a new season of my life and doing some different things that I've never done before. But I always, first thing I always do is I say, I got to find a mentor, someone who's already walked that path. Uh, for an example, my wife and I are getting ready to homeschool our younger children. Since the pandemic started, we started searching out and thinking about this and it's a, yeah, so next year we're going to do this. And, um, and that was the first thing I thought of, like, I, we got to find a mentor because I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. And mm. uh, the, just anything. So anything in life that you want to be great at and to be successful, look for someone you admire and someone you connect with and someone who's already walked that path that can mentor you. And I love the Frank Kern perfect day. I've actually never done that exercise. I've heard about it so many times and I think about purpose a lot and I think about, uh, you know, the life that uh, I desire to live. Uh, I've never done that exercise, but I loved how, you know, you kind of broke it back because I guess I didn't really know. You're right. Like the first thing you think of is, oh, my perfect day, I would grow up. Uh, you know, uh, wake up in an exotic place, go to the beach or something like that. Right. But he's, but I love that. It's more the average day, right? You can't just do that all the time and you're going to have challenges. It's just like, you know, li we live in life. So we're going to get sick sometimes. We're like, well, that's not going to be the perfect day. Well, that's just life, but you can have more perfect days than you did, uh, you know, before I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So love that. I want to really transition course here. So you talk about content a lot and you have a podcast called uh, The Millennial Millionaires Through Real Estate. So I think you're at like 225 plus episodes, which is cool. That's a mm -hmm. lot of, that's a lot of shows. That's amazing. And you also talk about content um, a lot on Facebook. And I actually saw this sheet that you put together this year that for every YouTube video, you wanted to come up with like 20 or 30 pieces of content from that particular YouTube video. So I actually really admire you on this content creation. So talk about that and like, why is that important? 
uh, for you? And do you think it's important for everybody? Well, you know, it's funny because the the weekend that I actually made that sheet, I was with another friend who he's like he's he different space, but super successful. You know, he's he's a millionaire at a young age, sold a couple of businesses. And he's like, I don't want anyone to know who I am. I don't want people to to get in touch with me. Like he wants to live in a cave and, you know, he just, he doesn't want to be like no public spotlight. He's right. like, I never want to be recognized, you know, whatever. So I think the answer depends um, on your wants and your skill set. You know, for me in this business, um, I, I do like the concept of helping people specifically to real estate. And I feel like a good way to do that is, getting attention that, that maybe they can then start learning about stuff. And in some cases, you know, it's much easier for them to know you than you to know all these different people, you know, like you could watch videos on Graham Stephan and you feel like, you know, him, but he's got 2 million subscribers. So there's no way he could ever get to know 2 million people, but Mm -hmm. he's impacted 2 million people. So part of like my Frank Kern thing. And also what I feel like gives me a little bit of purpose not even a little, that's a huge understatement. I love helping people. I love helping people get off the hamster wheel. So for me, that kind of, I feel like social media and content creation, it basically just amplifies whatever you're doing. You know, so if you have this conversation, you know, this is a great conversation, but maybe 5,000 people are going to see this conversation and maybe it'll impact one person, you know, but if we were having a closed door, no one would get the value out of it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Grant Cardone isn't for everyone, but you know, he puts out, he's a lot smarter than people think. Um, I have some friends that are in his group and, you know, he can be very serious too, but he's like, you know, it's selfish actually, if you're not helping more people and getting the message out, which, you know, some people might disagree with that. And he, you know, he's got another thing. It's selfish to not make money because then you can't donate to churches or charities or, you know, give people that you love money and, you know, whatever it might be his spin. But I guess to me, it just became important to amplify the message that people can do this. You don't have to have superpowers. You don't necessarily need to buy a course that someone, you know, whatever you can do it everyday strategies and you can maintain a lifestyle and a job. And, you know, you can, you can kind of unplug yourself from societal dogma if you want. So, um, yeah. And then like, it just became really important. But for me, you know, I feel like this is again, something we talked about a little bit on our show, Brett was just leverage. Like if I'm going to do everything, I want to do it efficiently and I want to do it in a way that, you know, we can kind of amplify it beyond. So like, um, that, you know, message and that post that I put up that day was just like, okay, every time I write a YouTube video, I have a script. Now that script can easily be chunked out and turned into tweets, into an article on LinkedIn, medium, Facebook. And I'll recommend again, tactical stuff here. Everyone should search Gary V's content strategy. It's a slide deck that he talks about how every day, this is going to sound insane, but every day you should easily be able to create 64 pieces of content. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds insane, but just the way he does it, you watch that and you go through the slides, you're like, I could create a hundred pieces a day. Mm-hmm. It's actually not as hard. But then again, you need some tools. We use a, an awesome tool called Buffer, where you can schedule out content weeks or months in advance. You could, anytime I have an idea, I either put it into Notion or Buffer. And then every Sunday or Monday, I get with my assistant. And then now we have um, a social media manager who just helps us schedule things out. Um, I will also say one other thing. I'm a big root cause analysis believer. So like I wasn't getting out the YouTube videos that I wanted. I had all these scripts and I realized like, why am I not? For me then it was, I have a horrible short-term memory. So I hated the process of sitting down and filming. So, you know what? I had to solve for it. So my assistant's like, you stink right now. She's a good accountability partner too. She's like, you got to get a teleprompter. Boom. We got the teleprompter. And now we're going to be getting two videos out a week, you know, and that's just now kind of getting through that. But um, yeah, so, you know, YouTube video script then turns into articles, tweets, you can use the thumbnails and Instagram posts, you can clip out the video and turn those into TikToks. you could take the still and put it on, you know, any of the other platforms, LinkedIn and drive people to that, um, you know, and then just, you can always kind of repurpose different types of content, you know, stories or LinkedIn stories, Twitter stories, whatever. Um, but, you know, I just think coming up with one thing that you're going to do is important or what one platform for me while I had the job as a Facebook group, because I had to ha- I had to be a little gated with my stuff. I couldn't put it out publicly. So we just started growing a Facebook group and doing giveaways for people that would add more people. And then we had virtual assistants going to other groups that were similar to ours and saying, Hey, we'd love to have you in our group. Here's the link. They were sending that message out a couple hundred you know messages a day and the, the group really grew. Um, you know, and then you can just continue to get that message out there. Yeah. 
I love that. And you said Buffer, and that's kind of a, a site that you can schedule the content because I think that's the biggest thing. It's like people get overwhelmed. They're like, oh man, I can't do this all the time and get on the Facebook and get on Instagram and then go over to TikTok and then get on YouTube. And then, oh, I, you know, that would take all your whole life, <laughs> you know? Full time job. <laughs> right. So I think it's just really important. I mean, that's what I always go to if I'm going to do anything is how do I strategize and build a system on this? And if I can't, then I, then I can't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because my time, you know, for me personally, I just think it's too valuable. Not that I'm Mr. Wonderful or anything like that, but I just, but I do value because I'd rather be spending time with my family than on trying to figure all this stuff out. Right. Um, so that's, that's a good website. Right. And you can do that on your personal like pages too. It's not just business. Is that correct? Oh yeah. You could link everything to it. And, uh, it's pretty clean and effective. And it's funny, Brett, even just one thing you said, like even sometimes I'm like, maybe this isn't like saving a ton of time or money, but I'm like, I just know I shouldn't be doing this right now. And that yeah. to me frustrates me. I'm like, right. why am I doing this? Like, this isn't <laughs> good. Like, I don't even care. Like, I just, I don't like doing this. Like, this isn't going to be a good use of my time. So I could, you know, what you said there, I could just totally relate to. Just, <laughs> why? Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's awesome. So I think, again, if you want to impact people, I think it's really important to create content. That's why I'm doing the YouTube video and, and we do social media because, you know, that, that's one of our, my purposes. I want to, I want to create like you and I want to impact people. Um, and, uh, you also have a podcast course out there and you have a couple other courses too, uh, Jonathan. So why don't you talk about that? So, you know, I got to give Joe Fairless the credit for doing the daily podcast. I read that book and the next day I started the podcast. I had no clue what I was doing, but he's like, you got to get attention. You know, you need credibility. You need thought leadership. You need a reason to reach out to people that have no reason to return your call otherwise than being on a, on a podcast and getting their message out. So podcasting, I mean, is just everyone. I, I know people would say it's too saturated, but who cares even the clicks you get, just the networking. Like you said, it. we have over 200 shows. That means I've added 200 real estate friends that I would have never spoken to, mm -hmm. to my network over the last year. I, I don't know another way that you can do that. Some of them I've partnered with. Some of them have become close friends of mine that now have mentored me on deals or stuff like that. So honestly, don't even start the podcast for the downloads or like making money. There's no money in it at the beginning and you're going to stink, but <laughs> you will meet so many people. And again, that's how we connected, Brett. But like yeah. you have a reason to reach out to so many people. Um, and then just like for the course, we found there were a lot of barriers to entry to podcasting and a lot of reasons people quit. So, you know, we started just kind of brainstorming why are we not quitting and what's kind of working for us. And what that kind of came down to was we delegate 99% of the process that we don't like doing. So like, you know, the only part of the show that I actually do is the interview. We have virtual assistants reaching out to other popular podcasts and just sending them templates and then sending them a Calendly link to book and schedule the show. They create the Google folder, they create the Google notes. And then all I do is record. I review their stuff a couple of minutes before, and then we record. Um, and then they do the, the show notes and they release it on social media. And, you know, I started telling some podcast friends about that. Oh, and it only costs us $9 an episode. And then I talked to some people and they're like, yeah, we're paying an editor like two or $3,000 a month. And I was like, dude, this costs $9 an episode. Like wow. you could, this could be 30 bucks or 40 bucks if you do a weekly show. Yeah. So um, based on that, we just created a course, you know, I'm not like pluggy. I'm not that type of person, but you know, and I also put out a lot of free content, but you know, I, I just think it's such an important thing that people can start, but a lot of people quit because they don't like doing the editing. They don't like mm -hmm. filling a pipeline of guests. They don't like doing the show notes. Um, these are all annoying things. Don't get me wrong. I just, didn't want to do them, but I wanted to do the podcast. So there was a way to outsource it, mm -hmm. um, which I know you're really good at too. You know, that's an understatement, but you know, just that, that's what the course was. And um, yeah, it's just, it's been a fun thing. We like to follow kind of a Michael Hyatt approach that anything that we find that we've kind of turned into a system, we want to teach others about or turn into a product. Yeah. And um, that's one that has already just helped a lot of people. So that's been cool. And, you know, I've Love been it. on the podcast, some students now, so it's, it's just a fun thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I'm I'm a big uh, component of uh, proponent of just delegation too. And uh, I always say like if I had to edit the videos on YouTube or to edit my own podcast or to even 
la- put it on the podcast site, right? I think we use Libsyn.com, put it on that site to go out to the other. I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. It would be terrible. Like I would skip episodes like, you know, so anyways, I'm a, I know what I'm good at and I'm the same thing. I, I enjoy the interviews and the, and the networking and there's such a connection with podcasting. So like, you know, in the networking, you're always looking for a connection, right? Oh, Jonathan, I heard about you from your friend so-and-so. Now we have a connection. Well, the podcast is really cool cool because I say, Hey, you were on my podcast episode 200 and, uh, you talked about this and now we just have that, that connection. Right. And I always say, it's really hard to ask, Hey, Jonathan, can I just like call you up and pick your brain a little bit? And you're probably like, eh, I'm really busy. No. But if I say, Hey, Jonathan, would you like to be a guest on my podcast? You would say yes. Be, and it's the same thing. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so true. But it's anyways. so funny, but it's so true. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, hey, Jonathan, before we go into the last section of the show, I just want to talk about your lifestyle. So you talk about lifestyle design, and uh, this was just a really fascinating thing of how you've lived this last year. And I talked about you kind of are a nomad. Um, and this is becoming just more and more well known. I'm very fascinated by, like I said, we're getting into homeschool, so I've been studying world school. It's like, oh, these world family travelers, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like so fascinating. I don't know if I would ever do it, but it is a fascinating thing. Uh, so when you're talking on your podcast, you were talking about just some of the different places you visited, and you go somewhere for a couple of months, and you talk about going abroad. Uh, here possibly in Hawaii, Philippines, things like that. So, so talk about that. Is it what it's all cracked up to be? I mean, talk about this lifestyle and, um, and you've also built your business around it, which is really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be different for everyone, you know, but like, again, just self reflection, self awareness, like, you know, it's just so important. Like I realized like Cold weather like depresses me. I, me I hate too. it. Like, I, hate I, it too. I don't I even want to go Indiana. outside. Yeah, like like we were talking about before. <laughs> it's terrible. Like, it, just, it just it's like whatever. Like people have different preferences. The I thing is though, like it. my wife and I, we always go. Uh, so Indiana, it's like oh, if you want warm weather, go to Florida. So we're like oh, well, let's move. But I but Florida kind of depresses me too because there's no hills. It's all flat. Alligator eats you. I don't know stuff like that. So, anyways, go on. <laughs> so you know, like I, okay, I guess at the root of it kind of back to like a couple things of we talked about like okay the frank kern thing and like getting clear on myself like i don't need a lot of stuff like for me i have I like i don't want to worry about like what do i even have to wear today i wear the same thing every day like i wear a henley that i can go play golf in i could work out in this is literally just a t-shirt it's like i keep like five of these t-shirts just like when i'm like no i'm not gonna play any golf so like for me, I was like, okay, what? I don't, I don't like decorating. I don't like nesting. That's another millennial term. Like I'll, my Airbnbs are beautiful, but like, I don't even care about this stuff. Like I'm just not a material person. Like I found for me, anytime I buy a thing, I'm like happy with it for like an hour. And then I'm like, didn't make me as happy as I thought. Like I'm back to my life, you know? (laughs) So I'm like, great. So, you know, for me, like, I just, I don't need the stuff. So that made moving around a lot easier. Um, Having a car is important though, when you're doing this, you know, but like, um, I I just, I didn't find like that. I was happy in one place. I almost felt like I would get into these ruts where like I, anytime I would change locations, I would actually find a little bit of like, you know, you're you're almost like shocked into a new system and you start having these new thoughts. Like I almost, almost always have a couple of good ideas when I fly Mm -hmm. because I'm just like in deep thought. It's a little bit of a pace change. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was just like, okay, warm weather places that I could play golf, places that I might have some friends, places that maybe I want to explore. And, you know, then just like for me, actually, I had to just sit down with my coach and we just went through like, where do I want to be throughout the year? So for me, what that next year is going to look like, I want to do five months in Florida in the winter, Carolinas, spring and fall, New York in the summer, and then one month abroad in August. And I'm going to just try that, you know, like, I, you know, why not? If I have a computer, I'm good. And, you know, like my stuff, it's kind of with me at all times. I just need my clubs or maybe like my clothing and, you know, like that's kind of just how I'm thinking about it a little bit. So, you know, I would say it's fun. You get outside of your comfort zone and you meet new people. And you're also just like forced to constantly make these like mental changes that I think keeps you sharp and keeps you smart. And like, you know, not just kind of like in a rut or a habit. And it's mm-hmm. not for everyone either. Like I'll probably get sick of it in like a couple of years 
And, you know, we could be doing a part two of this. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm settled in in Raleigh and I'm just happy. Or, you know, maybe I'm just a snowbird between Raleigh and, you know, West Palm or whatever. And, you know, that, that would be it. But, you know, right now I just, I'm excited to travel. I haven't traveled much and um, I want to kind of see how it goes. And yeah. like, I'm a big Tim Ferriss groupie. So I want to try to do that lifestyle for a little while, you know, see yeah. how that goes. I just think I, I talk about seasons a lot and we're all in these different seasons. And sometimes when you're doing this, it's like, oh, I got to lock myself into this for 10 years. And and you don't, right? And I did the same thing with this whole, whole homeschool thing. I'm like, you know, I don't have to lock myself into this for 18 years. I, let's just try it for a year, see how it goes. And mm. uh, and I think that maybe our listener can, that they can relate to that. It's like, hey, if you're thinking about something, maybe, and you're in this season like you are, Jonathan, uh, and you want to travel, just try, try it for a year and just see how it goes. And, um, you know, no regrets. Um, that's awesome. Well, I definitely admire uh, what you're doing. And has there ever been a place where you're like, man, I do not want to leave here to live there? Yeah. Just like, you know, you had to, like, you went someplace for like a month. You're like, man, yep. like, I, I really don't want to leave. This is really cool. Oh, oh, leave. Yeah. Um, you know, there is one actually, I thought you said live or and I'll, you I'll can just say both. Too. <laughs> um, Ohio. I just didn't really enjoy that much. <laughs> I don't know why, you know, like maybe because I didn't have a ton of friends there. Indy, I actually really like, but yeah. then again, I have some friends there and there was like more fun stuff to do. Ohio was just like, uh, what's the hype? Um, <laughs> but the place for me, actually underrated place that like I, I was there a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I don't want to leave. I have a couple of places there and it's just a special place to me. Pinehurst, North Carolina. Hmm. If you're a golfer, it's kind of like a golf kind of destination, but um, Pinehurst. don't they have like a famous course out there that uh they have a u.s open course yeah, yeah exactly yeah they have a uh, number to play two. that i think on like u.s open or tiger woods golf on video games or you definitely but, did yeah. it's, it's like <laughs> one of those you know courses yeah that's it's fun. that one that's cool. and it just like you know for me it, it kind of back to that question but i was like what do i need to be happy like i have a lot of it here amazing golf courses amazing quality of life nice people food's good you know, like I don't have a lot of, I can park my car where I want. I don't have to like worry about dealing with stuff. Like, you know, so that's a place that, um, I, I think I actually might try living there for a couple months and see mm -hmm. if, you know, it, it, what I thought it was is, but, um, it's a great place. I, you know, I have no reason to like sell anyone on it other than like, you know, I have some stuff there, but, uh, if you like golf, it's just an awesome place. So for me, it really, it hooks me every time. And, um, it's just a cool spot. It's kind of underrated. Cool. Awesome. I'll have to check that out. Sounds good. Jonathan, before we go, last section, uh, any any other advice for millennials out there? Okay. I'm not going to say just start. That's just the most overused advice on the planet. Um, you got to get around the right people, the bottom line. So you got to get that education and you got to find mentors, either pay or by you know bringing service to them and just get around them. You know, you're never too good to do someone's kind of grunt work if you're trying to learn about that industry like i said i literally was offering joe to cut his grass i was going to follow him with a camera i was literally whatever he said jonathan be at starbucks at three in the morning i would have been there because it just fast tracks everything and you can learn it all yourself but you know if it took 12 months maybe people quit after six so if you can shorten the timeline you'll have kind of more like base hits, I think, to keep momentum going and progress going so that the chance of quitting will be lower. So I just think either joining a group, starting a group, bringing value to a mentor, paying for a coach, like it, and if it's the first one doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. The second one might, or the third one might, but I just think it's such a hack and important thing. You got to get around people that are playing varsity speed if you're playing at JV, because then you'll go back to slow motion when you get back into your sport with your people. And, you know, you just, it's just about leveling up. So, um, that's the thing. And, you know, just bring them back, like even just any, like everyone needs help with stuff, you know, like if someone reached out to me and I couldn't even give them that thing, I would at least remember that they had that attitude. Mm -hmm. They were trying to bring service instead of what can I do for them? You know, like, who am I going to respond to the person that says, Hey, can you analyze this deal? Or, Hey, if you teach me how to analyze deals, I'll analyze all your deals for you. And then mm -hmm. they're going to get something out of that. You know, yeah. like who's going to get a response. So just, just, or another little hack here, ask people what their biggest challenge is. Don't ask them to be their mentor, mentee. But if you find out their biggest challenge and then it's something that you can somehow solve, like for most people right now, when I ask them that it's social media or marketing. So 
if you have time, just learn that. Go on YouTube and become a social media kind of whiz. You already got Buffer. We already talked about Buffer. So then just come back to them and say, hey, I'm going to do this for free. I'm going to become your kind of social media coordinator for the next six months. If I do a good job, maybe you pay me, maybe you give me kind of your mentoring and, uh, you know, we see how it goes. And three months into it, they might be a jerk and you might just quit or, you know, you might not like doing that or the thing and whatever, but that's, that's the way you got to get around the right people, whatever way you can do it. No one's too good for it, you know, period. Love it. Awesome. Two things that I really got from this interview that you do really well at is if you're in that rut or you feel like you're stuck, maybe maybe change two things. You can change your people you're around, your community. I think it's really important. Sometimes we're just so stuck in the same people and they don't think like that. So you just change your community or change your environment. I think you do really well at that, Jonathan. I heard that before is like, sometimes you just need to change an environment and, and that's where you get these thoughts that come into your mind. And, um, Really, really cool. Thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for just all your wisdom, man. It's awesome to hang out with you. Uh, I like to end every show with a little bit of fun. So this is called Fun with Farber. So you ready? Let's do it, man. All right. I got like six, seven questions here. These questions are usually, nah, 60 seconds or less answers. So, uh, so let's go. All right, Jonathan, you love golf. And you played in college, by the way. What was your best round ever? My best round ever was a 66 uh, that I shot mm, a couple months ago, actually, just off the cuff. Like wow. it was, I've, I've actually shot one better than that, but that was the best one just because I had no expectation and I thought I was going to stink and uh, just came out as a total surprise. It was at a course called Secession in South Carolina. It was just wow. a lot of fun. So I, I put That's that as good. number one. That's good. I like that. That's a that's a good round. All right, best golfer you've ever played against? Um probably I don't know that anyone would know him, but um a, a kid that's just done really well. He his name is Matt Lowe and uh he was like a prodigy in Long Island. Actually no, I'm going to pivot this answer actually cuz this girl ended up is a girl and she she kicked my butt. Her name is Kelly Shown. Matt, you're amazing too. <laughs> but this girl Kelly Shown is the first time that a girl beat me and uh she was like all everything from Long Island. She went on to play at uh Princeton and then she plays in the the LPGA Tour now. But I just remember she was playing, you know, the back tees where typically I think that's the men's tees. Yeah. Um but it's, you know, whoever wants to play there can play there and um she was hitting the ball 50 yards behind me and just beating me. And I was like, what is going on here? Um, so she's really cool. She's on the LPGA tour now. And that's what was her I, name? Uh, Kelly Schoen. Kelly Schoen. Okay. Gotcha. Kelly Schoen. That's cool. Yeah. What's been your, cra what's a crazy travel adventure? Um, I was in India with three friends and we were supposed to take a train, an overnight train from uh, Agra to, I want to say Jaipur. And we, I don't know if we we're running late or whatever, everything's in bad English, you know, that we're trying to read and we get to the, <clears throat> the train station and there's like a, you know, it's packed and we get to the front of the line and the guy's like, yeah, you missed your train, whatever. And we're like, oh, like we really need to be there. Like, how can we do it? And this guy just literally leaves his post. He's like, I'll drive you. And it's like a five hour drive. And we're like, what about all these people? He's like, no, it's okay. Like I, I got it. So like he literally just leaves his post. He walks us down like a five block, like alley, which honestly could have killed us. Um, and he brought us to this like group of like three friends and handed us off to this other guy. And that guy drove us five hours. Um, and then he had to drive back five hours. And I think he only charged us like 30 bucks. Wow. Um, were you guys scared India. at all that you, they were going to take you out and just murder you? Um, one of the, oh, we, yes, but like we all had phones <laughs> and like one of the guys is like an MMA fighter and like, we didn't like in India, everyone's like, yeah, you'll get pickpocketed, but it's not really like a violent country. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, honestly, we probably shouldn't have done it, but like we had a good vibe for these people and they, they could have killed us, but they didn't. And, um, <laughs> we made it. Awesome. All right. Do you have like an exotic travel adventure? I don't even know what that word, I don't know I'm trying to go there, but some, <laughs> um, <laughs> My favorite like trip was uh, <clears throat> if anyone like is looking for a reasonably priced, just like all in one amazing country, Peru, it's got everything, jungle, beach, desert, mountains, like it's just such an amazing country, not expensive. And um, I don't know, like seeing the, um, well, I'm drawing a blank on like the main thing in Peru. Um, 
that like mountain rock formation mm -hmm. may draw a major blank what machu picchu that was amazing that was cool like seeing something that's like you've seen a million times on pictures yeah um so that was cool we hiked that and um that's the cool. hike was hell i definitely don't recommend people doing that hike like <laughs> if you like aren't like in amazing shape like it was really rough but um yeah that was that was fun definitely enjoyed that's it cool. and like would love to go back to peru oh, cool man best app on your phone that you like this one is kind of a, a clear one for me. It's called Notion. Um, we converted all our project management stuff, note-taking to-dos into this app. And um, there's no perfect to-do routine task management calendar app, but this is as close as I found. And what I like about it, just it consolidated like five or six different apps that I was using. We were using like Todoist and OneNote and Notes and a lot of Google Sheets. Um, and just like, it was all over the place. And now this has become kind of like an all-in-one. It's a crazy robust tool. And, uh, there's definitely a little bit of a learning curve to it. But what I like about it is that for a lot of those other apps, like Asana and Monday, they're great on a computer, but they're not so great on a mobile. And like, I'm on my phone most of the time. Notion is incredible on the mobile app. So if I need to take a quick note or a picture or something, or, you know, add a to do or add someone to a CRM, it's very easy to do from the mobile app. So um, cool. for me, that's notion. I'm in there. Another little tip, check your to-do list before you check your texts and your social media, you will become a more productive person. And for me, I just always have notion up. I have all the other apps kind of like back on my phone, but that's a good, um, that that's one's, a good that one's cool. That's a good idea. No, I like that. Yeah. Notion. I'm gonna check that out. Um, best travel tip. Do you have a tip for travelers? Um, this is a stolen one from Tim Ferriss and just a lot of like nomad travelers that have been watching on YouTube, but like, you don't, you can buy most of the stuff when you get there and it can become a little bit of like an experience or an adventure, you know, like, so for all those like longer trips, like we packed like half a bag and then we just bought local clothes there. And like it, one, it made it more fun Two, like it was better for the pictures and three, like you don't have to lug around all this crap. And then at the end, we just gave it all to like, you know, homeless people yeah. and, uh, you know, it was all, all good, you know, and the pictures came out great and it was just fun. And my friends, you know, negotiating with people in markets, they don't even speak the same language. So, um, I'd say bring less than you need and, uh, you'll figure it out. Yeah. I like that. Cool. Uh, best interview you've done on your own podcast. Wow. Um, that is a really tough one. I'm actually going to go with a T-ball like not, and, and I'm not saying you, Brett, you did have a great interview on the show, <laughs> but, um, my, my partner, uh, I'm going to steal, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat here a little too. Interviewing my brother, um, after I'd been nudging him for years to do his first deal. Finally, he did his first deal this year. He bought a four unit in Dayton, Ohio. He's cash flowing about 1200 bucks a month. And, uh, you know, whatever I could say now we've talked about it, but like, I always felt bad that me being his younger brother, you know, was kind of known for doing more real estate stuff. And I, I just, I always wanted to push him to get into the game. So he did his deal and then he came on the show and we talked about it. That was yeah. definitely, and also he was super nervous. He was like stuttering at one point. I'm like, dude, like, let's just, it's just me. Like, let's yeah. just have fun with it. And it was actually a great time. And yeah. then the second one was kind of like my partner, assistant, like kind of my just, you know, like amazing uh, beyond helper, Claire Rosenberg. Um, she kind of came to me the same way that I talked about before. She heard me mention on one of my podcasts that I needed help with the podcast. And she's like, I'll help you with the podcast. And now she's become a mentee. We've partnered on deals together. We've partnered on business together. And now, um, you know, I interviewed her on the show, but now she's actually going to have an episode a week interviewing other women on the show, women Wednesdays. Nice. So, um, just being cool to see her progression and like, you know, have some small impact on, on some people's lives is just um, a nice feeling. So those are two that, that stand out and we're just like fun and, and close to home, you know? Yeah. No, I love that. And that just reminded me, yeah, my, I have an older brother, I'm two years younger and he, you know, I haven't really talked a lot about the real estate. I mean, he knows what I do and stuff like that, but I haven't ever pushed him and he's a lot more conservative, but that's just an idea, you know, just getting your family into it and one and the best for them. Cause he still has, you know, W2 job and he, and he might like it, but anyways, that's just uh, interesting. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for being on the podcast today. I uh, appreciate you, man, and uh, all your wisdom. And if you guys are tuning in, check this out on the Brett Snodgrass YouTube channel or any, um, you know, check out all the episodes and all the videos that we have on the Brett Snodgrass YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and comment, and uh, I'll get to those when I get a chance. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, Brett. Really appreciate you having me on.
Thank you so much for checking out the Brett Snodgrass channel. If you like this video, please slam on that like button. And if you really like it, then subscribe to our channel here. And remember to leave us a comment below, and I'm going to try my hardest to reply to all the comments. Thank you guys so much. This is why I do what I do. Every single week, I come out with content that focuses on success, freedom, and living out your purpose. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.